Hello, Sherco fans. My name is Brian Martin. I'm the publisher of Sherco Grand Slam Baseball. I'm not the inventor of the game. Uh, that honor goes to Dr. Steve Lachey. Steve and I brought Sherco back from a, a brief hiatus from the business uh, business world back in 2016 with updated graphics, updated uh, rule books, uh, spruce things up, change the ballparks. We have about 90 ballparks that are available in three separate packs. Um, we have about 70 seasons worth of uh, season sets available and are working on getting the, getting the 1990s and 2000 season sets all completed. We have some old time sets, some greatest uh, teams of yesteryear sets from the original Sherco set. They're actually in the original format. We PDF them. Um, in short, we did everything we could to bring the game back. But one of the things that we did not do is do what a lot of people have done, which is a demonstration uh, video, so to speak, of how to play the game. So what I've done is I've built uh, what you see on screen, which is a little Excel workbook that is basically a, a workbook that, that look, is a chart lookup. It looks up all the charts and it has some other features that help me play the game on the computer or anywhere I am. But I'm going to use it tonight to uh, show you and walk through a little bit of, of how the game plays. And for those of you that aren't familiar, what the game entails. Um, in the game book, you see this little icon here. That's a, a copy of the 1980 version of the, of the game charts. And those are the versions I'm using for this because it's the, the version I'm most familiar with. Our most recent version is all updated for 2016 with uh, new uh, results and some variable results and other things. We also have a plus version which takes the original Sherco formula and, and expands it to a base 36. And I'll get to that in a minute as we explain all this. But basically you have a field. Uh, the game comes with a what we call the composite field, which is sort of a, if you took all the ballparks together and mixed them into one and then threw them back on the field, you'd have that. What I have here is a fictitious park. You can make up your own. Um, this is Sam Houston Park, home of the Houston Oil Barons of uh, the United, United States Baseball League. They're playing the Detroit Crusaders today. Um, in a game. So your stadium chart, the yellow squares are all in the stands, the green squares are in play. The black squares represent the f placement of fielders. Now the game does advertise that you can move your fielders around. As a solo player I've discovered that this is the optimal setting for all your fielders and you'll, you'll have just as much fun having a set placement as you will shading the, the players. And as you play the game and learn the rules, you may shade the center fielder over here a little bit, knowing that there are a couple results over in this area, especially with the wind blowing that you want your center fielder to be in line for. Keeping in mind that if you use the optional wind factor, which we're not going to today for this demo, is that if you move the center fielder over here, but the wind is blowing that way, balls that landed close to him here may wind up now dropping in for hits. So the, the wind adds a little element to the game uh, that means that the fielder placement can be important, but I found that these, these solitaire placements, the pitcher and catcher must be where they're at there for obvious reasons. Um, and I think it, it plays better that way. But we'll, we'll walk through this. So you have a, you'll have your field out. You'll have your markers on the field for the, the, the batter, for the players. You'll have a marker in either side of the batter's box for the batter. I've chosen to use a, a brown square that highlights the, the side of the home plate area that's being utilized by the batter. Um, these squares are all 15 feet to a side, so it's 90 feet here to here to here. So it's six squares between the bases. The bases are located at the points, these intersection points of each line. So we want to say throw to a base, you're throwing to this square, but it's really the base is right. You can't see it, but it's right there. You set your lineup, and as you can see down here, here's the Crusaders lineup, which has been set. These ratings all mean something. We won't go over what they actually mean because we have the, we give you the formulas, and it tells you what the ratings mean. What we want to do is show you how to play the game, and utilizing these basic simple teams, we can get there. Uh, the first thing that happens in a game of Sherco is after you've written out the lineups and you've put down the, the ratings, including the fielding ratings, we don't show the fielding ratings here, they'll pop up on screen, is you have to then uh, have a matchup. And so the first batter comes up and you look at his rating. He's a C11 single star. And Ian Hart, the pitcher, is an L7X1214. And this 45 represents the hit number, which is when a C batter 
faces a, an L pitcher. The hit number is 45. I have the batting advantage turned on here for the game settings, meaning that if you face the same sided pitcher, your hit number is downgraded one letter. Um, it's upgraded one letter if you're facing an opposite hand pitcher. So um, that batting average, that's all factored in. The numbers will change. Again, if you have the game, you understand what I'm talking about. If you don't have the game, it gives you an idea of, of some of the, the features that are available. That batting advantage is worth one dice pip, which is about 2.8%, which is about the approximation of the difference in the platoon advantage. It's about two twenty-eight one hundredths of a of a uh, percent uh, of points, in other words. So a 270 hitter hits 298 against the other side and hits uh, 242 against the uh, same side. So there's a 0.28 difference. Anyway, the math is irrelevant. So once you have this, uh, this number, you would then roll the dice. And what I've done with this to show you what the outcomes are is that the dice, after you throw the very initial pitch, that's it's called the pitch, and usually the way I, when, you, when we play it face to face, is I would pitch for my team. So I would roll the dice as the pitcher, and then anything that happens on the batting side, the offensive team rolls, and that's that's usually the way it's done. Some people do it the opposite way, but um, when you're doing it solo, it doesn't matter. So 45 is the probable hit number. You need to roll 45 or better on two dice, and the way the dice are read is the lower the number die is read first, and you can see here that these are all the possible dice combinations, 1, 1, 1, 2, and 3. You'll notice there is no 2, 1, because you read the lower die first. It's a 2, 1, and 1, 2 are always read as 12. These are all the combinations, 11 through 66. You need a 45 or higher, and I, what I've done is this program highlights the four dice rolls that will get that to you because 66 is a special event in every case and on a, a probable hit which we'll get to in a minute um, it becomes an, a possible error so 66 is always special always keep that in mind there are other ranges here this range here the pitchers walk rating right here 12 means that 11 and 12 are walks his K rating is the difference which picks up right after 12 through that number. So 12, then 13 and 14 are strikeouts for this pitcher. Anything over 14, up to 45, so 15, 16, and all these and down, are probable outs. And we say probable because based on uh, where the field, uh, where your fielders are, the wind, the size of the ballpark, they may be outs, they may not be. Probable outs can turn into probable can turn into a hit. Probable hits can turn into outs depending on where the fielders are. So once you have the matchup for the batter, you, there's a chart that we don't not showing here. You look C, you take look at C on the chart, and then L. It's like a grid, like a like you know a cross section. You'd find the number 45, and that's what we're going to need to get higher than that. So for this program, we just need to click here to basically pitch. You don't see the pitch because we. I'm going to reveal the, the game is set up in a way that I reveal it one piece at a time. So we reveal the pitch. The result of the pitch is 46. You'll see that's the dice roll there. It's a probable hit. You then go to the probable hit page for bases empty. There are eight different on-base situations. So there are eight probable hit charts, eight probable out charts. We will go to the bases empty chart. And we don't have that, but we have it loaded into the, the program here. So when I click this button, it's going to tell me that the, the roll, you then roll again. The roll is 25 to 5. It's a ground ball to 12, 18. So the ground ball means it can't be caught. It's already bounced at least once, or it's rolled through. It's a line drive. It has not hit, it has already hit the ground once by the time it gets to square 12, 18. So no fielder can catch a ground ball and make an out. On a ground ball, you choose the fielder that's nearest to the ball to make the play. In this case, the computer automatically knows that the right fielder is closer than the center fielder, so he's the default fielder. So there's your right fielder right there. He's highlighted. And my program tells me he's four squares from the ball, one, not counting where the right fielder is. There's one, two, three, four. Okay. So you're going to need to know something about the right fielder. The right fielder has a two-digit rating. It's, it's expressed as 84, 94, 85, 95. The 9 is the arm. 
The four is the range. The range is only used on fly balls and pop-ups. This is not fly ball or pop-ups. We're going to use nine. Nine is his arm, and we say arm in quotes because it's really a fielding and throwing and movement factor. So every time when the fielder has a nine arm, he will automatically get nine total movement points to move to and throw the ball toward a base every single time you roll the dice. If you roll the fielding dice and they are 10, 11, or 12, then he will get 10, 11, or 12. This allows for the, the strong-armed play. So the first thing we do is, you'll notice here it tells me that there are that from where the ball is and where the how far the ball is from the fielder to move to the ball and throw it to first base is takes a roll of 14 which cannot be done so this batter is going to get a single but you have to make the first throw so we make a roll and the dice roll is going to come up here in a second this is a slower machine the dice roll is three so he's guaranteed nine so we would go one two three four five six seven eight nine and the ball is right there where you see that little square that ball now is i've got this already computed the ball is now five squares from second base you could send the runner to second base however because the fielder gets a nine and and the right fielder's nine is in play until another fielder touches the ball he'll get a second throw it's an extension, so it's stop action. Each thing is one one piece of the uh, the puzzle. His throw is heading into second base. It will beat the runner there. So you would, as the offensive manager, say, okay, I'm going to hold the guy to a single. You do not have to roll the play out. You know that the next roll would get it to a base. And you can either cut it off by having it thrown to one of the fielders or have one of the fielders move. And any fielder that moves in the infield, uh, is a free move. So if you said, well, I'll, I'll have the shortstop cover over here and throw it into the second base, the shortstop, there, you don't count. The shortstop is considered to be moving away from the play, so you do not have to count it. You may move the marker over if you like to, just to get the, the visual feel for it. So safe at first. So what you would then do is you'd flip your chart book to the runner at first base uh, page, and again, this is a slower laptop, so the macro is taking a while to run. And this thing actually puts a runner at first. And then here we're going to advance the batter because we're going to the next batter in the lineup, uh, Austin Walker. So Walker is a C batter. He has no number after him because he, he didn't hit very many home runs. The pitcher is still the same. And left-handed batter, right-handed pitcher, the number is still a 45 when it's C versus L using the batting advantage. So we have a runner at first. We have nobody out, top of the first inning, so we roll the dice, which this macro does here, and then we reveal it. It is a 24, it's a probable out. So now this will roll the dice a second time. So now that you've, the first die, the first dice roll is always determines whether or not the batter strikes out, walks, maybe gets a hit, maybe gets an out or some special event has happened. So it's a probable out. So we roll the dice a second time to look at whichever other charts we may look at. In this case, it's the runner at first probable out chart. And we click it and it's the result is 1, 2, or 12. And it says it's a fly ball to 1818. If the hit and run is on and the ball is caught, the runner returns safely. So we didn't call the hit and run. The ball is hit to 18-18, that's this square here. It's right at the center fielder. On a fly ball or a pop-up or a line drive, you look at the fielder's range number, the second number. That number is either a four or a five. And if the ball is within that many squares of the fielder, he makes the catch. In this case, the ball is hit right at the fielder, he makes the catch, and the runner doesn't go anywhere. Because if you did send the runner, it would be considered a sacrifice fly. And as a result, the fielder would get to make one throw toward the infield first before the runner moves. And in this case, the runner would be clearly out at second base. So we record the out. We advance the batter. And I'm not keeping track of it. Well, I will I'll do this here in a second. We'll keep track of runs, hits, and errors. So we have a hit on the board, one out, and Chad Webster, the catcher. He's also a C. So when you have the same letters and num letter combinations, the, the number becomes ingrained in your head after a while. 
It's another 45 for, pro for the probable hit. We will roll the dice. And we'll reveal that it's a 12. And that means it's it's less than or equal to this number, so it's a walk based on balls. So now that means that the runners are now at first and second. We change to the first and second charts, which you can't see. They're all being loaded in behind. We advance the batter, and now two men on and one out here in the first inning. So Spencer Turner, he's a C12. The 12 is his home run number. That may or may not come into play if he gets a probable hit. We'll see. Again, the pitchers, the pitchers' ratings stay the same until you change pitchers. So we'll roll the dice again, and we flip, and it's a probable out, almost a hit. See right there, it was the last possible out before the hit, so just missed a hit. Um, but again, it's a probable out. It could be a hit. Let's find out. We click, and we get a result of. 14, a ground ball to 3-6, but the runners advance safely. So there's no play allowed on either runner. They're going to go to second and third. And because he's a left-handed batter, um, and it doesn't say opposite field, the batter always hits to the side he pulls to. So the left-handed batter pulls to right field, the right-handed batter pulls to left field. So he hits a number down the first baseline that only the pitcher can field. The pitcher is closer to the ball than the catcher or the first baseman, so the pitcher is going to have to scramble off the mound for this. He is three squares from the ball. One, two, three. The pitcher is an 84 pitcher. We look at his eight because, again, it's a ground ball. We look at the eight, and if he's one, two, three, four, five squares from first, he will automatically get the eight. You can roll the dice if you want, count out the squares, but once you know that it's within eight, he's out. So these are some shortcuts you'll learn from Sherco that mean you don't have to move the ball and count things out. After a while, you'll know ground ball to 3-6 for that result will be to the pitcher. Pitcher will be, if it's a left-handed batter, it'll be five squares away. He'll be out automatically. The runners will advance, and you can mark that on your score sheet, and it makes the game, I call them Sherco shortcuts, things you learn as you play that make playing the game faster. So you get some muscle memory, so to speak. So we do have an out. We do need to flip the charts over to the second and third base chart. We do need to record an out as soon as it lets me and advance the batter one more to Trevor McLaughlin. McLaughlin's a C11. Again, if the batter has numbers after his letter, it means he has some power or some triple ability. A number in parentheses is a triple number. Um, none of these guys have a triple number, so we won't get to, won't get to see that rule. So C against an L, this is the first left, right-handed versus right-handed, so you'll notice the number is now 46. It's a downgrade because he's facing a same side pitcher. Runners at second and third with two outs. We do not have to do anything funky. We'll play the infield at normal depth. Uh, you can play the infield in, and by in, it means any squares that are inside the infield here, inside the baselines, is playing the infield in. That's important because some designations say if the fielder is playing in, then X happens. If he's playing back, Y happens. Um, so it, there's some danger in playing in for certain results, but we're not going to do that here with two outs. And so with two outs, we're going to have that. We've rolled the dice. I might have already done it, but it's okay. Rolls them again. Um, and we reveal 46. It's a probable hit. So again, he, he had the lower chance. He only had three opportunities, three different combinations. He got it, and so we roll on the probable hit chart. And you'll notice it says probable hit runners on second and third. So ground ball to 10-19. Again, the left fielder can't catch this. It's grounded or lined. It's bounced at least once from here to here. The ball is two squares from the left fielder, and it tells me that here that one run is scored. Why? Because the left fielder cannot possibly throw the runner at third out from there. He, he, needs, he needs more than 12. Not to mention with two outs, there's the two out hit and run, which means every runner with two outs advances to the next base safely. And the only play that can be made on him is on at the second base. And that means that in order to make a play on this runner going from second to home, I need to roll 18, which I cannot do. So I just make my first play, and I get a roll of 
six, which means I get eight. So I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That puts me five squares from second, so the runner will not try to go to second because the next roll of eight would get him. This runner on third automatically scored. This runner was already rounding third when the left fielder came up the ball, so two runs have scored. There's now a runner at first base, so we flip back to the runner at first base chart. We advance the batter, and we chalk up a hit for Detroit, and we chalk up a pair of runs. And so Gabriel Daniels is the batter now, C11. So he's almost out of the inning, but he's going to give up two runs here. And so Daniels is a C versus an L. Again, it's lefty versus righty. The number's back to 45 again. We'll roll the dice. We will reveal a 55, a probable hit. Now, these dice are, are just defying the odds at this point. You can see this huge band of results that would be probable outs, that all the dice rolls have been up in this range. And so another probable hit, we'll roll the dice again, get a ground ball to 518, same process. The right fielder is three squares away, and then he's another further 13, another eight, 10 squares away. So 13 squares to first base, 13 squares to second base. So he can't catch him, but on the, on, with two outs, the runner's going to go to third, and he needs a throw of 18 to catch him. He won't do that, so the runner will go to third. Can't make a play at first. He's going to get nine, so he'll be 13 minus nine is four. He'll be at least four squares from second base. So you can see how I'm, I, I'm now doing the math in my head. I don't have to count it out. I'll have to count it out early on. And we do have some tables on the Sherco website that are the distance to squares table, which tells you exactly how far each of the squares are from home, first, second, and third. And you just add in the number of squares the fielder is from the ball, and you can do the math pretty instantaneously. But again, that's if you want to Sherco shortcut it. If you want to plot it out and count out every single time and move the ball every single time, that is absolutely positively up to you. However, you want to enjoy the game, you go right ahead. I'm taking some shortcuts because I'm trying to do this electronically and do some teaching. So I'll there'll be some things. So let's just plot that out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's the minimum. Let's roll the dice and see what he gets anyway, just for fun. He rolled a four, so he gets the nine. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the ball would be there, and you could see four squares from the next base. Now we've got runners at first and third. We advance the batter again. It's Brendan Matthews, the designated hitter. He's a plain C, right-handed versus right-handed, so 46. And we will pitch one more time. And reveal a 33. It's a probable out. This should get him out of the inning. Let's find out. The next roll is a ground ball to 710. And if we were to attempt a double play, the runner on third would score. We don't need to do that. Um, and now comes the nice little two out conundrum. You can play for the 6-4. The second baseman is going to freely move here automatically. He gets to do that for free. You can go for the 6-4 fielder's choice, or you can go 6-3 to first base. If you go 6-3 to first base, the, the ball is hit directly to 7-10, which is where the shortstop's playing. The shortstop is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 squares from first. He has a 9 arm. He will make the play no matter what you roll. However, if you decide to go for the runner moving from first to second for the fielder's choice and the put out at second. You have to roll, he's two squares away, you have to roll a three, two, three, four, five, or six on a single die to get the advancing runner. And so you're, you can take your chances. Well, let's do that. I've got a little routine over here that rolls a d6. Let's make that. And if I, if I, if I try that, that runner from third is going to score. So it's a risky proposition, but we'll roll it anyway. And we roll a four, which is well within it. So the shortstop flips the second baseman for out number three, 
and we hit the out and advance the batter, which will reset all of our stuff and get us ready for the bottom half of the first inning with Detroit leading Houston 2 to nothing. So Colton Manning is the Detroit pitcher. He's an L7X, but he is an 11-14, which means he only walks if you roll snake eyes, and he has a bigger range of strikeout numbers. The C versus L will still be the same. It's a 45 because it's righty versus lefty, so the range of, of red numbers is still the same as it was for um, the previous pitcher, uh, Colton Manning. Uh, or I'm sorry, uh, the previous pitcher was... Um, I've forgotten his name already, um, but but same ranges. It's just that there's more strikeouts for this pitcher. He walks fewer guys. So we'll see if we can go through the bottom of the first here um, fairly quickly. So we roll the dice, and we get, I'm hoping we get something with a fly ball. It's a probable out. It's 45, so it's a fly ball to 1820. The ball's been hit here. The ball is two squares from the center fielder. He's the nearest fielder. He has to go for it, and his range is five. So if the ball is within five squares of his position, he will make play, and indeed he does. He makes the catch, and there's nothing else you need to do. You advance. Well, you wouldn't advance the batter. You'd go the next batter on the, the score sheet, and you'd pick up the dice, and you would roll them again fairly quickly. And this is a probable hit. And the hit is 36. It's a ground ball to 1120. Again, the left fielder, the closest fielder. The ball is three squares, three squares from the fielder. And according to this, the ball is 20 squares from first base. So you can't roll a 20. Um, but you will make the first roll because you have choices. You rolled a 9. He gets a 9. Again, if it's 10, 11, or 12, you get 10, 11, or 12. Basically, you get the minimum unless you roll more than the minimum and that that's what you get. So it allows for the strong arm throw. And sometimes the greatest plays that I've seen in my Shurko history have been the the ball is 11 squares from home plate. The runner is rounding third. Uh, it's it, it's the it's the winning run if he scores. So you you let it all hang out. And you send him home because you know the the fielder needs an 11 to bring the umpire into play and a 12 to to throw him out at home and you roll the dice and he rolls a 12 and you cut the, the the game winning run down at home plate and that's been those are some of the most exciting plays and I think if I can stop here for just a second um, I think it's what makes Shurko to me the most interesting game to play. Steve says it's the most fun to play. Um, I say interesting because all games are fun in their own way. I say interesting because with the stop action system of throw, move the ball, make a decision, then throw again, move the ball, make a decision, especially for things like inside the park home runs, which are possible. It allows you to play the odds, but it also allows you to have those miracle moments where you look at the math and you say, only a 12 kills me here. I'm sending the runner, and doggone it if you don't roll a 12. And you get that assist, and that's that's how she, that's all she wrote. So the 9 means I would move 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. The ball would be there. It would then be 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 squares. As you'll see here, it says it's 6 squares from second base. Another 9. He's guaranteed 8. It, it, He'll be out. So we'll just say it is a single. We flip to the runner at first chart. We chalk up a hit for Houston. And with one out, there's a runner at first base now as we will advance the batter and get to Trenton Webb, who's a B12. So he's got some power. Um, the power numbers run from 11 through 23. Um, and so you can see 11 means that's the only roll that gets you a potential home run. 23 means all of these rolls potentially are home runs. So a guy like Babe Ruth has a, a very wide range of hitting a home run if he gets a probable hit. So we'll see if Trenton maybe gets a probable hit here that we can use. Because he's a B, his hit number is higher, and he has an additional hit number at 44. And we will reveal... 45 probable hit. Let's let's have let's let's hope for a nice low number, 11, 12, 13, something like that. The roll is a 26. So another ground ball to 419. Um, the left fielder is one, two, three, four squares away. 
the ball is 20 squares at present from first base and 15 squares from second. So the left fielder is at least going to come over and he's going to get the ball and throw it back. He rolled a three. His minimum is eight, so he'll move eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because the ball now is less than 12 squares away from a base, I now have a decision to make. I can throw the ball into second, which means the ball would have to go to second first before it could then redirect to another base. Or I can cut the ball off with either the shortstop or the third baseman and say that's as far as it goes because once they have it, then it's a quick throw. So I will just say that because it is seven away, if I went for if I went to go to third, I'd be out. And so we have a single, be first and second. I'll throw the ball into the third baseman, cut it off, stop all movement, flip the chart to first and second, advance the batter, record a hit. Now you got one out, two men on, first and second. Uh, Brett Ellis is the batter. He's a B13, so he's got a little more power than Webb did. And we're going to roll and see what happens here. I'd love, I'd love to get a home run on the board. I'm, I'm doing this as though that this, I'm not trying to uh, make this happen a certain way, and it's a probable out. And we roll, and it's a pop-up to 611. So pop-ups, line-outs, and fly balls use the fielder range, not the arm, at least not to see if he makes the catch. The ball is popped up right here. It's one square from the shortstop, who's the nearest fielder, so he has to take it. And he'll catch anything within four squares of him, so he makes that catch. Also note that with less than two outs and runners at first and second base, this would normally qualify for an infield fly rule. That only comes into play on a couple of where instances where we note that the infield fly rule is in effect because we've got the squares position that it's possible the ball will fall in anyway. Um, so you could invoke the infield fly rule uh, here if you want to, um, and it would certainly be appropriate. We've hard coded that in the newer rule books, especially the plus rule book, um, chart book, to make that realistic, but he's out. So out advances the batter. So Ellis weekly pops up for the second out of inning number one. And it will bring us to uh, Perry Williams, who's a straight C against an L, so he has very little power. We will roll the dice and reveal them over here. It is a probable out. And the roll is a ground ball to 610, which, because he's a right-handed batter, um, why did it? there I believe it is to the opposite field that's why that's why that is so 610 and I believe it's opposite field is the, it, the, the rule book will tell you opposite field if it means that I didn't code that in because I have it coded in the background but it's to the opposite field so the right-handed batter nubs one the opposite way it got out in front of the pitch right to the short right to second baseman the second baseman is two squares from from uh, Second, so a, a simple D6 roll of two or more, uh, of three or more. Let's do that. Let's just try that because if he rolls a one or a two, something else different happens. So he's gonna he's gonna try and flip it over the shortstop here, and the roll is a six. So he makes it. So it'd be four six put out that ends the inning. On a roll of one, he comes up short, and therefore it is a it is a fielder's choice. Everybody's safe. If it's a two, it goes to the umpire, and the umpire then, the automatic umpire chart on any tie, is then invokes the runner's speed and the fielder's arm to determine if he's out or safe at any base. And so um, the umpire can be interesting. The umpire can also be used to answer simple yes or no questions. If you're not sure how to score something, did that runner score on that non-tag, uh, non-force out play at home plate? And you're not 100% sure, you can ask the umpire and there's a special question answer uh, role that you can have at the bottom of the chart that says yes or no and, and do it that way. Um, so I hope that this little demonstration, about a half an hour or so, has given you a feel for what Sherco is and how you can play it. 
we didn't see everything and I could have tried to program the dice to be certain things to come up and make sure we had home runs and that we called the hit and run and all that other stuff. But I wanted you to see how, how the game just normally progresses uh, and how it would normally play. Um, if you get a, let's, let's just go, let's just assume for a moment that this was a probable hit and the batter had a, say, 13 home run number. If I roll a thir 11, 12, or 13, then I will, there are those, all those readings from 11 to 23 all have two possibilities. There's the reading if the number does not fall within the batter's home run range, and one if it does. Generally, the ones that do are fly balls that carry further in the ballpark than the ones that don't. So power is taken into consideration. Let's say it was a 12. And the batter's home run number was what a 12. And it said fly ball to 12-26. I don't have the field numbers on here, but you go 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The last row is 28, 27, 26. That fly ball would be right there. And because that fly ball is on the yellow square, that would be a home run. If it said the ball was hit to 12, 25, the ball would be there. If there was wind, the wind could blow it into the stands. But in this case, we're not playing with wind. Then you would look at it and say, okay, how far is the left fielder from that point? One, two, three, four, five, six. No fielder can have a six range except by some special um, event that comes up in the game. Therefore, that ball drops in for a hit. So that fly ball is just beyond the reach of the left fielder. And now the left fielder has to move one, two, three, four, five, six, and then move in. So you're looking at a potential double, maybe a triple. A ball out here could be an inside the park home run by the time the center fielder gets to it and tracks it all back in, depending on his arm. So you can see how where the ball lands and who the fielders are and where they're positioned all can combine to make this uh, game interesting to watch and fun to play. And the stop action system is basically nothing more than saying, we're going to take a snapshot and the center fielder goes over and here's the ball coming back to the infield. So he's, he came all the way over here and he got the ball here. Now move the runners again. Now that ball is going to travel another roll. It's 11 square. So now the ball's here. Oh, now the runners. We're going to send the runner home. Oh, what? It, it, it gives you that, that feel of that ball coming into uh, the, the infield and in toward the field of play. And it's a step-by-step -step process. But it, to me, it's cool. Um, and I know, I, I know part of this is, you know, hey, I got I to gotta sell the game and talk the game up. But um, this was the first commercially produced um, game of what, what was back then the big three of, of baseball. Uh, there were two other games that are very well known that were at that time, and Shurka was the number three. Um, it was the only other third choice. And so when it came out, it was different. It was unique. Um, the whole grid system is based on, on war gaming, essentially. Um, and <clears throat> it's kind of cool because you can see the action unfold. It's not ground ball to 6'10", shortstop flips to second base, double play. Well, if you have a weak-armed second baseman and a weak-armed shortstop, that ground ball might just barely get to first base, and you might have the umpire going, no, he's safe at first. It's not clear-cut. If you play the shortstop back too far, he's too far away to make a play. If you play him in too, too close and the pop-up goes up and it's outside his range, it drops in for a hit. So there's elements that these are not automatic. Now, a lot of it will, if you leave fielders in a certain place and you learn the optimum position like I have, you'll see that a ground ball of 6'10 will be a double play with runners with a runner at first base with a nine arm uh, at second because you'll do the math and you'll roll the dice and you go, yep, that's a double play. And you'll learn them, the short go shortcuts that we started to talk about a little bit earlier. Um, that will get you to the point where you can um, feel more comfortable with the game. But you'll get there. It takes a while to learn how to play the mechanics of the game the stop action system do take a little bit of time to learn, but I hope this video has gotten you part of the way to how that all works and how the system works. Now, for those of you wondering, well, could you do a Sherco Plus demo? This isn't set up for Sherco Plus. This is actually set up for original Sherco. Um, I would advise people who've never played Sherco before, 
Um, and not because we want to sell you two different things, but I'd say if you've never played Sherco before and you want to learn the stop action system, buy the, buy the basic regular Sherco classic game, this game, with the updated rule books and charts. Learn the mechanics, because everything that you learn in cl classic Sherco translates to plus. The difference in plus is the pitching system is different. Some folks have a little trouble with, the, with learning that pitching system. We make it easy for you to do that because you can then upgrade and just buy only the plus parts that you need. And then you'd need plus seasons, which that's where the expense can get in. But again, if you buy the game with the 2019 season and you play it till you learn it and you feel like, oh, I want to do more and I want to get plus, get the plus upgrade kit, which is just the things you need to get to plus, and then buy a plus season. And then you can bank and up your mind and decide whether you want to continue playing Classic Sherco, plus, both, and then you make your, uh, your uh, purchases accordingly. The stadium charts are identical to in both games. They use the same grid charts, and there's nothing new about plus, so you don't have to buy new ballparks. only thing you have to do is make sure you have the right season. If you have plus, you have to buy plus seasons. If you have classic, you have to buy the classic seasons. Other than that... This tutorial should be a help to get you started. We have our email address, shirkobaseball2016 at gmail.com. We have our Facebook page. We have our website, uh, which is um, http uh, sites.google.com backslash site backslash shirkobaseball. And you can go there, and that will, that's will that got a bunch of freebies and some other information about the game. It has a sample inning of play that takes you further than, than this does uh, that you can print out and look at and refer to and kind of move your pieces on the board. Um, lots of cool stuff there. And uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this video. We hope that you'll join us in the Sherco universe if you don't already belong. And if you've been thinking about it or you, you want to go back and pull that game out and refresh your memory or uh, you've just bought the game and you want to have an idea how, how to play it, we hope this has been very helpful to you. And uh, until next time, this is Brian Martin on behalf of the doctor, Steve Lachey. We appreciate your, your purchases. We appreciate your loyalty as a customer. We appreciate your friendship as a customer. And we hope we get to see you again sometime down the road real soon. So long, everybody.